This is Annabelle, and you might recognize her as the possessed doll from the Conjuring universe, where she terrorizes anyone who crosses her path. And I'm sure you lay your head down at night in peace, knowing that this is just a movie. But is it really just a movie? Because this is the real Annabelle. And not only is she a very real doll, but the films were based on actual accounts experienced by Ed and Lorraine Warren. And that's right, they were real people too. But how did the spirit attach itself to it? And is it a spirit at all? Have people actually died because of her? To answer that question, we need to start right at the beginning with the origin story of the real Annabelle. As far as my memory serves me, I have always loved The Conjuring Universe. In fact, it's been at the root of my love for horror and paranormal films. But never would I have actually imagined that any of it was based on real life events. And yes, I know that Hollywood has a tendency to want to dress up things to make it more appealing for film. So I don't believe that even if it was real, that it went the way the movie portrayed it to be. But nonetheless, there's people that have come out to say that the events of Annabelle actually did happen. Just really quickly, before we get into this one, I did want to mention this is the first paranormal case on this channel. So if you like it, please let me know. Leave a comment, hit the like, just let me know. I'll make more. So let's figure this out together and do the deep dive into the rabbit hole. In 1970, Deidre Bernard celebrated her 25th birthday and received a special gift from her mother. It was a raggedy and doll, and it was meant to be a fun gift to brighten up the mood in her apartment. But the moment that Deidre laid eyes on the doll, she instantly fell in love with it. The next day, Deidre carefully placed the doll on her bed with its limbs stretched out. However, within a few days, something strange began to happen. Each morning, Deidre would leave the Raggedy Ann doll seated with its arms and legs extended. But every night, she would return to find the doll in different positions, sometimes with its legs crossed, with its hands resting on its lap. There were even moments where Deidre would discover that the doll's arms were pointing outwards as if it was silently indicating something. As time went on, the doll's behavior became just more strange. It started moving from room to room, all on its own. At this point in time, the entire apartment began to feel uneasy, as if this energy was being created by the presence of the Raggedy Ann doll. Man, I got shivers just talking about this right now. 20 years ago, I would have not believed a single word of this, but I have since seen things on my own, so I'm just getting flashbacks of all of it. One evening, Deidre arrived with her roommate, Laura Clifton, who was also a trainee nurse, and Laura's fiance, Cal Randall. And as they opened the door, a startling sight greeted them. The doll was kneeling on a chair, and its large black eyes were fixed upon them. Surprisingly, the doll had moved from its usual spot in Deidre's bedroom. And this disturbed them because they couldn't explain how the doll got there or how it was in the position that they found it in. They decided to reposition the doll in the position they found it in and make it kneel once more. However, since the rag doll lacked joints, it simply just flopped over each time. They could only conclude that some unknown force had kept the doll's limp legs in a kneeling position. And from that moment onward, the inexplainable occurrences surrounding the doll grew increasingly more bizarre and frequent. They started finding random messages on parchment paper around the entire apartment saying, help us or help Cal. What made this even more strange is that there was no parchment paper physically in the house. Now, suspecting that somebody might have been playing a prank on them and breaking into their house, Deidre and Laura took preventative measures. They left marks around the windows and doors and rearranged furniture, hoping to find some evidence of an intruder. However, their efforts were useless because the doll continued teleporting from room to room, but nothing else had been touched. Now, they claim that one day they returned home and found a horrific sight. The back of the doll's hands was smeared with something that appeared to be blood. And there were three distinct blood stains on the doll's chest. 
Naturally, this scared them to death. So Laura and Deidre decided to contact the psychic. The psychic had connected with the spirit of a seven-year-old girl who claimed to be inhibiting the doll. The psychic explained that long before the houses were constructed in the area, when it was still just grass and fields, the little girl used to play there for countless hours, building memories up until her life was abruptly cut short. Following her passing, the spirit of the child used to wander the fields, and when the apartments were built, the hallways became her new home. However, the fast pace of modern life meant that everyone was too busy at work to play with the little girl. This left the little girl without playmates or friends. However, fate would take a turn when two young women would move into the apartment, bringing along the Raggedy Ann doll. Finally, the spirit had found something to engage with in two young people who are likely to understand and open to playing with her. But this is just where it gets flat out strange because through the psychic, the spirit made a request. She wanted to live inside the doll and to be with Deidre and Laura. Now they were touched by the story of the little girl, so they wholeheartedly agreed, welcoming the little girl named Annabelle Higgins into their lives. But this only marked the beginning of the true haunting. The doll transformed into Annabelle and the two young women started treating her as if she was a real, living, breathing person. She ceased being just a doll and actually became Annabelle. Despite the nurse's intentions, Cal, Laura's fiance, held strong beliefs that no good would come of any of this. And you know what? I simply agree with Cal. Yes, the story of the little girl is sad, but I don't want a living spirit with me. I would have done my best just to get rid of her like right away. But he viewed the doll as some sort of voodoo doll, scheming to deceive and exploit them. And frankly, I think he was right. Annabelle went on to perceive Cal as a threat. And in the weeks that followed, Cal was tormented by nightmares and a sense of unease. And one night when he was half awake, he witnessed Annabelle gliding over his body. And before he could react, her hands tightened around his neck as the doll's large black eyes looked into his own as her grip around his neck sought to drain the life out of his body. And despite his efforts to push Annabelle away, she remained unmoved as if he was trying to push a wall. And eventually it seems like Annabelle let him go, but this incident wouldn't go forgotten. Shortly after this incident, Cal and Laura found themselves alone in the apartment. They started hearing strange noises coming from Deidre's bedroom. Now Cal decided to investigate, which probably wasn't a good idea. The only thing he found was Annabelle, who had been thrown onto the floor. When he approached the doll, he suddenly felt a sharp pain on his chest and realized that he had been clawed. There were seven claw marks that had been etched into his chest. And when Laura discovered him, his shirt was covered in blood. It was becoming increasingly obvious that Annabelle's attacks were intensifying, putting all their lives at risk. Now, at this point in time, the story of Annabelle eventually reached the ears of paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren. Yes, these are the people that are portrayed in The Conjuring movies, and they were real people. In fact, those movies are based on their accounts of the paranormal. After they arrived at the apartment and heard what Deidre and Laura had to say, the Warrens concluded that the strange occurrences were caused by a demonic presence. They determined that there was no actual Annabelle, but rather an evil spirit that had taken advantage of an unsuspecting psychic. And Deidre and Laura had unknowingly given it permission to inhabit the doll, which ultimately gave it permission to cause them harm. And according to the Warrens, if they hadn't intervened, the demonic entity would have likely killed them within a week or two. And recognizing the urgent of the situation, Ed reached out to a priest and requested an exorcism of the apartment. The priest would end up performing the exorcism and bless both the apartment, Deidre, Laura, and Cal. And at Deidre's request, the Warrens agreed to take the doll back with them to their own home. And while Deidre, Laura, and Cal were now free from Annabelle, Ed and Lorraine were just at the beginning of their own ordeal. Annabelle was placed in the rear seat of the car, and it didn't take long for the Warrens to sense the presence of the demonic spirit that was riding with them. Now, despite their car being up to date with maintenance, it started stalling and the power steering went, even the brakes malfunctioned. Ed at one point even claimed that he had lost complete control of the vehicle at times. 
and only by a hair avoided several potentially fatal accidents on the way home. And on the third time the car would stall, Ed grabbed a vial of holy water from his bag and splashed it on the doll. After that, the demonic spirits stopped bothering them for the remainder of the drive home. Once they arrived home, Ed found a spot for Annabelle in a chair next to his desk. And the Warrens have remembered that the following days, the doll exhibited strange behavior, such as levitating and mysteriously appearing in different rooms along the house. Lorraine, who was alone at home on one occasion, even heard growls that echoed through the entire house. At one point, a priest had even visited the Warrens to discuss their recent encounter with Annabelle. Now, during that conversation, the priest picked up the doll and said to her, you are just a rag doll, Annabelle, and you cannot harm anyone. Now, Ed warned the priest against making statements like that against the doll. And as the priest was leaving their home, Lorraine urged him to drive carefully, as her clairvoyance had foreseen that he could be in danger. Unfortunately, a few hours later, the priest was involved in a car accident that resulted in the vehicle completely being totaled, all because his brakes had strangely failed. And over the years that followed, more instances of paranormal activity were reported to be associated with Annabelle, including one death. In fact, the situation became so dangerous that Ed and Lorraine decided to keep Annabelle secured in a glass case with a clear warning, do not open under any circumstances. And believe me, I would not. Like, what the heck is going on with this doll? The story of Annabelle has been told by various authors on various occasions, most notably Gerald Brittle, who based his entire book on the Warren's own accounts. Now, despite its claims, the story has been widely accepted as being true. In 2014, these events even served as an inspiration to the popular prequel to the movie The Conjuring, which again, I am a huge fan of. Those movies are awesome. I don't care what anybody has to say. However, when it comes to the concrete evidence supporting the claim that Annabelle was possessed by an inhumane, demonic spirit, there is little evidence to be found. Now, aside from the testimonies from the Warrens and the Raggedy Ann doll herself that's locked away in a glass case, there's very little proof to validate the story at all. Even confirming the names of those involved in the actual story can be a little challenging, as Deidre sometimes has been referred to as Donna or Debbie, and the initial handling of the case itself by the Warrens has been kind of scrutinized. You see, during their initial meeting with Deidre and the others, the Warrens collected little to no physical evidence. They relied solely on the testimonies that were given. And again, it could be argued that Lorraine's clairvoyance allowed her to see and know that the doll was was actually possessed. But also the validity of her clairvoyant abilities has also been scrutinized. And even though Deidre, Laura, and Cal may have no reason to actually lie, the possibility of misinterpretation or misremembering was never considered by the Warrens at all. They basically just heard the stories and concluded that the doll was possessed. Now regarding the sense of relief in the apartment, after it was exercised by the priest, it is possible that it could have been because of the impact that the priest's presence had on religious individuals. So maybe Deidre, Laura, and Cal being religious felt because the priest blessed the home, the situation was just dealt with. There's even individuals that claim that Deidre, Laura, and Cal just don't exist in the first place. And even though Ed and Lorraine Warren have always been seen as sincere and compassionate individuals, their work and establishment of the New England Society for Psychic Research in 1952 has been met with significant criticism and controversy. Even at the age of 92, Lorraine is still working and occasionally hosting lectures and evening events. And yes, if the Warrens conducted their research honestly and maintained professionalism, it would also be unfair to criticize them for making a living. But it is also that that has raised questions about their honesty, the fact that they're making a living from this. The Warrens Occult Museum is regarded as the oldest and only museum of its kind, drawing attention from around the world, and it's undoubtedly their life's work. And Annabelle, even finds her home there in a glass case. But I want to know your thoughts. Is Annabelle just a well-constructed hoax or is there any truth to the story? Leave it in the comments below. And again, I just want to make it clear. I'm not siding with people criticizing the Warrens saying that any of this is fake or the people that say it's real. 
I personally have experienced things and again, I can't explain any of it, but I know that they happened. There was a point in time years ago where I had a roommate. One night I had passed out watching TV and surely enough around 3.30 in the morning, I woke up to, again, my TV being turned on. Again, I didn't think much of this because, well, I fell asleep with it on. Now, as soon as I hit the power button and turned it off, I could hear the voice of a girl singing on the other side of my wall. She was humming and she was doing this. So I naturally did what I think most people would do. I texted my roommate. Now my roommate at the time was a singer, so it wasn't uncommon to hear her singing throughout the house. It was just weird that it was at 3.30 in the morning. So she texted me the next day and asked me what my messages were about at 3.30 in the morning. She told me she was not home. She went on to tell her then at the time boyfriend about the story and he knew what had happened oddly enough. And he told her that he recognized the song. And it was that of a little girl that follows him around that had attached herself to him because he was playing Ouija one day. I guess he made contact with her. But the little girl sings because she calls for her lost dog. I don't know what that spirit was doing at my house, but it was there independently without him there. But again, because of things that have happened to me like this, I tend to have some sort of belief for these things. But again, stop wasting time. Hit the like, the subscribe, and the bell as it lets me know that you're enjoying the content that I'm making. And if you like true crime, hit this video right here. So remember to stay safe, and I will see you next time when the lights go out.